Welcome to Comfort and Growth, the podcast for people who are passionate about personal growth and productivity. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that is so dear to so many of your hearts and to mine as well. It's about struggling and how we really get over the hard things in life. And I don't know for whatever reason, over Chinese New Year recently, I had so many people reach out to me. There were people who were disappointed um, that they didn't get the promotions that they wanted or they had gotten retrenched. There were people who were going through really bad breakups or even breakups with business partners. There were so many people that seemed to be going through really big crises. I don't know if there was something in the water or something about that time, but it just seemed like everywhere I looked, including in my own family and my own system, um, there were there was a lot of stuff going on. And to be honest, I felt really overwhelmed at times. It's not the first time I felt this way. In my life, I've had to deal with a lot of stuff. A, a lot. I mean, I've been through a miscarriage. I've been through a divorce. I've been through retrenchment early on when I was a banker. So I think that, you know, in some ways, every time I go through something really, really hard, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have people to guide me, but I had to sort of learn through just trying and through experimenting. Therefore, today, what I want to share with you is really based on 40 something years of experience with getting through really hard things. And I would like to be super practical in today's podcast. And that means that I'm going to go through actually almost like what I would teach in a workshop, but in a very conversational way, how we can learn practical methods and like, you know, a framework of thinking about resilience and getting over hard things in life. I think I should also say that the world is changing so fast and our lives are just getting more and more complex. I mean, if we zoom out a little bit, like it was only in the past 300 years, there was this concept of work. And then in the industrial revolution, people went to, you know, factories, they did work, but then there was an on point and then there was an off point. And then today we live in a world where there is no off button. People are always on. Even me lying in bed at night, there is that temptation to grab my phone and look at what are the latest DMs that I got? How many likes did I get? Do people really resonate with the content? Uh, am I liked? Am I popular? What did my clients say in response to my email? And all of that, all of this stuff is occupying my brain. And if you think about it, just like 10 years ago, this stuff wouldn't even exist. There was no social media. There was no way your clients could get to you before the days of email. You you would just be able to have an off button and go through your life actually renewing, refreshing, and resetting, having that sort of rest time. And today I'm shocked by the number of people who tell me that they sleep with their phone next to them, they never have an off button, and if they do self-care, they feel that they're guilty because it's something that they see as self-indulgent. So if you think about it, social media, smartphones, all of these have only existed in the last 10 to 20 years, and they've only really become very popular in the last 10 years or so. Before then, for the entire history of humanity, since we were cavemen and cavewomen, we've been walking around, we've been going to bed when the sun sets. There's been no way that people have been able to get a us, you know, stakeholders, multiple stakeholders so far have been able to badger us for requests. We haven't been pressured with having to put our lines online for, you know, hundreds and thousands of people to judge us. And today we live in a world where we are always on. It is a nonstop judgment factory that we're subjected to. We put ourselves out there and judgment comes at us at, from all corners. Judgment comes from inside, self-criticism, why did you say that? Why aren't you working hard enough? Why aren't you doing enough? And we compare ourselves to other people. And judgment also comes from outside. It's now so easy for anyone to reach us, especially in the age of social media. Every time I go on social media, to be honest, it feels like I have a giant inbox for the entire world to get me and to tell me, oh, you should be doing this. You need to uh, dress differently or you, you maybe need a haircut or maybe you need to explain something or maybe this point that 
you made I disagree with, it's a giant inbox for everyone to come and give their judgments on you. And I don't think on one level that it's healthy. I think all of us are dealing with judgment and whether it's internal or external judgment, it's really much the curse of the modern world that with more data comes more judgment. And that's something that I think is very normal to struggle with. So if you are feeling overwhelmed by everything, I trust me, you're not alone. I coach so many people who are on the covers of magazines. They are industry titans. They are people who present this image that I have it all. And even celebrities who have millions and millions of followings. I've seen all these people come to me and reveal their insights. But the weird thing is that we are always comparing our insights with other people's outsides. On the outside, when we're scrolling through social media, we're normally feeling a bit down, a bit depressed, you know, a little bit like, oh, we're needy of stimulation. And that's when our insights are affecting us. And then we look at other people's outsides and everyone only posts the top 5% of what they do in their lives or the top 1%. Oh, look at me. I just finished. I just want a, a new deal. I just finished an amazing presentation. I'm just like cuddling with my kid. Honestly, if we all compared insights to insights, the bottom 5% of our life. If you could see everyone that you know crying on the bathroom floor, feeling overwhelmed, feeling like they're a loser, trust me, it's a common experience. Everyone's been through that. I've been through that. It happens a lot. I still have those days where I'm like, I just need to be alone and have, have that moment of, uh, you know, being in a funk. But at the same time, after 40 something years of experience, there is also a kind of deep knowing and a confidence that I have the resources to get through this. So coming back to today's topic, resilience and how we get through hard things. On one level, it is about knowing that you have resources, enough resources to match the challenges that you are experiencing. So when people are anxious, when people feel like their lives are out of control, it's because the challenge level of what they're facing is this high, but their resources are like this. They feel under-resourced. They don't have the support. They don't know what to do. And because of this mismatch between the challenge level and the resources that they have, therefore they struggle and they find it really hard to get through with it. And resources come from what I call five gardens of resilience. Before I go into that, actually, maybe I should take a moment to define what resilience actually is. Because a lot of people have a misconception about resilience. Now, resilience is three components. And the first one is bouncing back. That is the one that everyone thinks of. Life knocks you down and then you bounce back, you rise. So that's the first element. But the second element is bouncing back with learning, with growth, with transformation. There is no point just getting up 100 times only to make the same mistake over and over again, again like Groundhog Day. So, um, you know, resilience is about rising up again, but with learning, with transformation, that you're a different person when you rise. And therefore, you don't tend to make the same mistake over and over again. Then there's the third element of resilience, which is pursuing your long-term convictions. That means that when we bounce back and when we learn and grow, it must be in service of something. You must have a North Star. You have to have a direction to go towards. And that sense of meaning, of purpose, is really what fuels you to get up, to learn, to grow. It must be in service of something. So therefore, you must believe that your life is intrinsically meaningful. And there must be some values that you hold dear to yourself that really you're aiming towards and that guides you. Now that we know the three elements of resilience, now we need to know how do we gather the most resources that we can. Imagine that you're like a gardener and your job is to get the best harvest 
from five gardens, right? And if you have a big harvest, it's going to help you get through like winter and tough times and, and all of that when nothing's feeding you. So in the same vein, we're all gardeners. We all have to tend our gardens of resilience. And there are five gardens of resilience that we can plant seeds in, that we can water, nurture, and harvest crops from. I've been teaching people this model for... I don't know, maybe like eight to 10 years now. And it's simple, but also a lot of people go into resistance around certain gardens. So stay open-minded, stay with me, and uh, let's do this together. So let's start with the first garden. The first garden is the mental garden. You can work on your mental resilience, right? And that means you need to plant seeds of healthy habits in this mind garden. For instance, I always swear by a mindfulness practice. It helps me clear my mind. It helps me start off the day feeling fresh, right? But I always say it's simple, but not easy. So many people go into automatic rebellion about doing nothing or practicing mindfulness because they think it's just not for me. But I highly recommend doing it because there's many different kinds of mindfulness. There's informal mindfulness, which is actively noticing. So you can do mindful listening, mindful eating, mindful walking, mindful jogging. It's not the kind of like, it has to be you sitting down in like some kind of Zen position and doing meditation for half an hour in a cave. It's not that at all. But mindfulness is about carving out a slice of time to focus on the present moment, to carve out the space so that we can actually take stock and actively notice what is going on in our lives, in the world outside and the world inside. For example, mindful journaling is a very powerful practice. I love journaling. As you know, with my journal, it is a contemplative practice just for that five, 10 minutes at the start of the day. Can you actually focus yourself on your own priorities, not other people's priorities, but your own priorities, and also take a moment to reflect on something important, meaningful. That's why in our journal, we have all these prompts for you every day. And a secret tip, you may not have realized if you have our I Am Wall journal, but every day there's a different prompt and each of the prompts actually cycles through the five gardens of resilience. So there might be a, a mental prompt like, you know, one thing I'm learning is there might be emotional prompt like the last time I cried was, there might be a physical prompt like one thing I'm good doing good for my body is dot, dot, dot. Yeah, but we cycle through the five gardens of resilience. Secret tip. In the mental resilience garden, there is also a lot of value in learning how to optimize your beliefs and your mindset. That's another important thing. When people go for therapy, for instance, one, one very popular therapy methodology uh, is called CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And that's all about understanding your what we call negative thinking pattern. Some examples of uh, negative thinking patterns are like catastrophizing, always going to the worst case scenario, making it like a slippery slope. Like for instance, I'm in a Zoom meeting. My boss looked at me uh, and seemed to frown. Then the next thing I'm like, oh, my boss must have frowned because my boss doesn't like me. And then she she thinks I'm uh, actually terrible. And I, you know, next thing I'm I'm going to I'm going to get fired. And then my life will be miserable. Then I can't pay my mortgage anymore, or whatever, right? So that's catastrophizing. That's an example of a negative thinking pattern. And then there is like black and white thinking. Black and white thinking is like, oh, they're either my friends or they are my enemies. It's either a success or it's a failure. This was good or this was bad. And in today's world, black and white thinking is not very helpful. For example, I had, I had a friend who was really struggling to have friends because she felt like there was always something that her friends would say or do that made her doubt their loyalty and their sincerity. And she'd be like, I just want somebody, in, uh, people in my life to be like 100% for me. And like they're either for me or they're against me. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That is a very black and white way of thinking. I mean, for me, I think friendships and friends are on a gradient. There's like 0% for you to 100% for you. And most people are somewhere in the middle. You might have that friend who is like 
maybe 60% for you. Like she's quite supportive generally, but maybe when you do something that, you know, is super successful, maybe she'll feel a bit jealous and she'll make a little kind of comment. And like, that's what 60% for you looks like. And then there's people who 40% for you, maybe they will occasionally do something that's helpful, introduce you to someone, but maybe behind their back, your back, they'll blah, blah, blah. And like, maybe they're not as helpful as they could be. To me, life is all shades of gray. <laughs> I don't think anyone is either good or bad, this or that. We're all human. And I think like the earlier we start to understand how to actually develop healthier thinking habits, the better and more well-adjusted we will be. So there's actually about nine or 10 of these negative thinking habits. There's negative filter, for example, where let's say your boss goes into a meeting with you and they spend like half an hour telling you feedback about all the things you've done and there's so much praise in there, but then they say, oh, there was just this one thing that you didn't do well. And then imagine after that meeting, you start just focusing on that one thing, that one minute that they spend criticizing you and the rest of the 29 minutes were good things. That's a negative filter. People with a negative filter, they look for the negative and they over-focus, over-weight, over-fixate and can't let go. So again, with a negative filter, the invitation is actually gratitude. Having a gratitude practice trains your brain instead of scanning and finding the, the negative, you're going to actually train your brain to replay the whole day and you're going to scan and you're going to focus on the positive. So with that gratitude practice, whether it's a ritual like sharing with your partner or, uh, you know, writing in your journal before you go to bed, like I scan through the day and three specific highlights of the day were dot, dot, dot. And some people say it's repetitive or it gets boring, but like, if that's the case, you're not focusing on moments. You're probably focusing on, I'm grateful for my family and my health. And like every day you write the same thing, <laughs> right? So I want you to encourage you to actually find the moment. So scan through the day and even something small like, oh, I discovered $5 in my pocket that I forgot, or lipstick that I forgot about. It can be as small as that. It could be like, I receive a thank you email from a client. It could be somebody gave up their seat for me on the bus. It doesn't have to be huge, but there's a quote by Brother the Stendhal Rust who says, like, maybe we can't be grateful for every moment, but in every moment, there's always something to be grateful for. So I kind of shortcut this because I want to get through the other four gardens, but what I want to kind of leave you with is that there's a lot of mind work that we can do in terms of controlling our attention through mindfulness. There's learning how to focus properly through also productivity, like writing down your top three things that you want to get done today, uh, setting goals, for example, and also making sure that we work on our negative thinking habits. And I will drop a link in the show notes so that you can understand more about negative thinking habits. I run entire workshops about negative thinking habits and identify which ones are your personal favorites and then learn how to reframe those negative thinking habits. So let's move on to the second garden of resilience. This is emotional resilience. In emotional resilience, firstly, I want to share that a lot of people think that emotions, like difficult emotions, are things to avoid or things to ignore or things to fix. And the truth is, emotions naturally dissipate if we witness them without judgment. What do I mean by that? You know, in therapy, if you come for, for uh, any sort of therapy, most of the work is in the awareness of what's going on, and then the expression, being able to speak about it. And research suggests that when we are able to be very specific and to give a label to our emotions, that actually helps us a lot more than just ignoring them and just kind of like repressing them. This concept in psychology is called name and tame. Because when we are able to name our emotions, we actually engage the prefrontal cortex of our brain, the part of our brain that's responsible for emotional downregulation. So imagine if like I'm sitting here and I'm feeling like, oh, like I'm just like so like annoyed and frustrated and my insights are tangled up and ugh. imagine I was able to sit down and with a little bit of mindfulness, this is how mindfulness works in conjunction, be able to now get specific and say that 
right here, right now, I'm experiencing like a big knot in my stomach. That's what it feels like. Right here, right now, I feel a heaviness around my heart. It feels so heavy. Right here, right now, I feel a block in my throat. And what I think my feelings or what I feel, I sense my feelings are, are shame, disappointment, background of confusion, and impatience. Okay, so I've just named a bunch of emotions. If you were analyzing my brain, you'd probably see the moment I was specific and named those emotions, like with very specific detail, like in the background, I'm confused and then the foreground, whatever, right? But like the moment you can see me actually name those emotions, I'm engaging my prefrontal cortex and that's down-regulating me and what we call the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of our brain that is like the alarm bell of your brain that rings and goes bing, 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 like wake up, wake up, something terrible is happening. And the amygdala wants you to wake up and to be aware of what's going on. So in other words, emotions are just data. Whenever you experience an emotion, especially a difficult emotion, there is a reason for that. Your body, your, your, in your infinite wisdom, you're, you're, you're trying to communicate. Your emotions are trying to give you data. For example, like if you're angry, the function of anger is to alert you, whoa, somebody is stepping on your boundaries and you better wake up. If you're jealous of somebody, the function of that jealousy is, uh, oh, this person actually has something that is dear to my values and I long for that and I should wake up. So emotions are trying to get you to wake up. And like, rather than repressing and shoving them away, we need to just decode. Actually, I don't like the word just. I should say we need, need to instead decode the data that the emotion carries, almost like it's a gift and we want to unwrap that gift and see what lies within that gift. So Naming and taming, very important. And you can do that through speaking to someone, a trusted person, a safe person, whether it's a coach, a therapist, your best friend, your partner in life. Naming and taming will help those emotions regulate. But also we want to use breath work as well if we're going through something very difficult and my, I'm getting flooded by my emotions. You want to come back to your senses. Why? Because, you know, oftentimes when we're being flooded by our emotions, right, we need to kind of come back to the present moment. And when we focus on our senses, our mind actually and our emotions can jump to the past and into the future. We can go into, oh no, replay some trauma from the past, or we can jump into the future. What's going to happen after next? And it makes it very hard to stay in the present moment. But the moment we focus on our senses, what am I smelling? What am I seeing right here, right now? What am I feeling? What's the temperature of the room, the air conditioning of my skin? The moment we refocus on our senses, that is when we start coming back to the present moment and we stay out of, in the past, rumination, which is associated with depression, always being in the past, replaying events of the past, and then we stay out from the future. You know, what if, what if, what if, what if, that is associated with anxiety. So the antidote is actually being in the present moment. And that is why sometimes when you see a psychotherapist and you are, you know, say going through a panic attack or, you know, feeling extremely anxious and you feel like, oh my God, it's an emergency, right? What they will often prescribe is a 5 4 3 2, 1 method where they'll ask you, okay, number one, name five things that you can see. I can see the chair. I can see my shirt. I can see my hands. I can see that. The next step is they go through the, the, the senses, right? Four things that you can hear. For example, I can hear the air conditioning. I can hear my heartbeat. I can hear the, the squeakiness of my shoes, whatever. And then like things that you can taste, things that you can touch, things that you can smell. That process is very important. The five, four, three, two, one. Try that method when you are feeling anxious so that you can pattern interrupt and come back to the present. Of course, there's other ways of dealing with emotional resilience. 
I strongly recommend therapy for everyone. I felt the most important thing I ever did in my life was going to the Hoffman process, which is a very deep emotional sort of like therapy retreat. Well, it's not actually emotional therapy, but but it's being run by a psychotherapist and it's a very powerful process for working on difficult emotions and releasing yourself from uh, you know negative behavioral patterns. So that is one thing. And then of course, it, with emotions, self-compassion is a very powerful practice. And that in itself could be an entire episode. In fact, I think we've done an episode, a podcast episode on self-love and self-compassion. So go back and listen to that one. Now, moving on to the third garden of resilience, that is physical resilience. Honestly, like this is one of the places that I would recommend you start. It's almost like I want you to visualize that you have a big wheel. And on this wheel, there are like five handles that you can grab it and start turning the wheel. These five handles represent the five gardens of resilience. Like this is the wheel of resilience. You can grab it from the emotions, the mental, you can grab it from the social, the spiritual, and you start trying to move the wheel. But oftentimes I tell people that the handle that is the biggest, that sticks out the most, that's the easiest to grasp and start generating that momentum is actually the physical handle. That is because sometimes when we're really stuck, it can be very confronting to start working on our mind or sometimes we can get lost in our emotions. But working on a physical well-being, for example, setting a bedtime, setting a wake-up time, going out for a jog, sometimes that's simpler for most people to start with than like trying to piece out their emotions, for example. In the physical resilience bucket, it's probably things that you already know, but are very, very powerful. When people come in to see Greg, you know, my husband, who's a clinical psychologist, and they are really struggling. Oftentimes, like, you know, even when I go go and ask him for help, sometimes, you know, he's not my therapist, by the way, boundaries and ethics, but, you know, sometimes he will, you know, start off with uh, the physical. Are you sleeping? Are you eating well? right? How many hours are you sleeping? Do you have a proper bedtime? Do you have a proper wake-up time? Routine is so important. I cannot overemphasize this. And I am somebody that hates routine. I am very spontaneous. I hate to have a a, a go to bedtime because I love to stay up late. I'm a night owl. I hate to have a wake-up time because I love sleeping and I'm a bed person. It's often called it meditation. I just like to lie there and like chill, you know? But at the same time, I know it's good for me. So I force myself to do it. My kids, actually, this is really funny. I'm going to overshare. I was a stay-at-home mom for seven years, six or seven years, something like that. Very long period of time. You know, I left my kind of high-flying flying corporate investment banking job and then became the stay-at-home mom in the middle of nowhere in Australia. And people thought I was living you know, the good life, right? Like, oh, you don't have to work, don't have to your kids, you know, live in the middle of this beautiful vineyard, countryside, whatever. But I was really depressed. And, you know, my kids would see me, and because I stay at home mom, you don't really, you know, in a way have like a set work time or like a set go to bed time. So I was just like waking up whenever, going to sleep whenever. And I was starting to feel really, really depressed. And struggling, waking up in the morning, feeling that my life was meaningless. Like, what is it for? Feeling like so cut off from the world. And I remember my my, my kids like coming into the room and just like on weekends, they'd be like, mom, wake up, wake up, like, get out of bed. And it would be like 1130. And I still haven't gotten out of bed. It's like really hard for me right now to comprehend that I was that bad in that state. And then when I announced that I was going back to work, right, to a university in Singapore to take on the senior leadership role. The first thing my kids asked is like, but mom, you don't wake up. You don't wake up till like, you know, like sometimes you're in bed until lunchtime. Like, how are you going to go to work? Like, they were so genuinely curious. And that's when I, you know, I realized that actually, you know, what's so important to mental health is having a sense of meaning and purpose, like having that job, having that sense of like, yeah, I'm doing something meaningful. It gives me, gave me the, the get up and go and to break out of that depressive funk. And also once I started, no choice in NUS, you know, I had to work, I had to get to the office at this time, I had to leave this office at this time. I actually really thrived by being on a schedule. So what I'm saying is that sometimes what we want to do 
isn't necessarily good for us. And I think always in the back of my mind, I had this, this inner wisdom going, Crystal, you need a schedule, you thrive on a schedule, but I just ignored that inner wisdom and went with like what I wanted to do. So coming back to physical resilience, have a proper going to bed time, bedtime, bedtime routine, wind down routine, no social media, two hours before bed, no checking your email, that sort of thing. Make your room really cold, you know, do something peaceful before bed. Fill up your mind with good things before bed. Gratitude ritual instead of like reading the news and being alarmed, checking your stock prices the last thing before you go to bed. No, no, no. You don't want to do that. So bedtime, waking up time, cannot overemphasize this. Also taking care of your body, nutrition, moving, uh, your body. So watch the episode that we have with Rihanna Rupani, who's that, you know, amazing holistic nutritionist and really take care and nourish your body. Now, I think body is something that a lot of people on the internet talk about. So there's so much resource out there for many ways in which you can take care of your body and move your body. So I'm going to now move on to the next garden. The next garden of resilience is spiritual resilience. And this is one garden that is often overlooked. Not a lot of people talk about spirit or spiritual resilience. It sounds so woo-woo, especially if you're not a religious person. And I am not like a, like a formerly religious person. I don't go to church or to the mosque or anything like that, right? But I have a very strong spiritual practice. So let me define spiritual resilience. Spiritual resilience is number one, you feel that your life is intrinsically meaningful. You feel a sense of meaning and purpose. Number two, you feel that you're part of something bigger than just yourself. You feel like there is that sense of like awe and wonder at the world. And you feel connected to this big world in a way in which you feel like you're very engaged in. When I was depressed, I felt like I wasn't part of the world. I felt like I was living and experiencing the world through six inches of glass. I really felt cut off and isolated. And when you have spiritual resilience, you feel like, no, I am one. That is that feeling of oneness, that common humanity. It's like some people tell me when they go to church and they sing, they are one. When they go to the mosque and they pray, for example, when they go to the Hindu temple and they take part in fire ritual, they feel that sense of, you know, oneness, that sense of awe. Awe and wonder is such an overlooked subject. I often feel like one day I'm going to write a book on it. There are a couple of books that I could recommend. I'll pop them in the show notes. Dacker Keltner, great social scientist, has written The Power of Awe. And there's another book called Something About Wonder that I'll put in the, the, the show notes again. But we need to feel a sense of wonder, and I feel like today, our younger generations, even, you know, I should say everyone, is feeling so jaded and so cynical. We don't have that sense of like childlike wonder. We feel like, oh, we've seen it all before. It's like, I've already seen like, oh yeah, top 10 bucket list, most amazing destinations. I've seen that on Instagram already. Lah. Oh yeah, you know, posted this funny thing. Oh, yeah, I heard that before. I saw the TikTok on that. It's like sometimes like we have lost that ability to marvel. And imagine how powerful that is when we're young. Every single day is an opportunity, many, many opportunities for us to marvel. When you look at a young kid, they're like, my God, dinosaur bones. That's incredible. How did they build the pyramids? Look at the mysteries of the universe. There's so much magic. There's so much wonder. There's so much inspiration in the world. Like when I brought my kids camping in Australia, you give them a muddy campsite, a puddle, like a box and some tree branches and like some mushrooms. And they have created this magical universe of wonder that, you know, as adults, we just get so jaded by and then we just take for granted. And we need that wonder and that awe as adults. So I would encourage you to connect to something that brings you that sense of wonder. 
For instance, for Greg, it is walking in nature. Whenever we go to uh, San Francisco, we always make the pilgrimage to the redwoods. And Greg has to hug a tree. He has to look at a massive redwood tree and just look up in the sky and like marvel. Wow, we are so small. The redwoods have been around forever and they will continue being around forever. In the scheme of things, I'm so small and everything, the universe is so big. It is that sense of smallness that leads us to wonder. And I always think that we spend a lot of time looking down when actually the wonder is a process of looking up, looking up at the sky, looking up at the stars, looking up at the trees, looking around at the people around us, marveling at the old couple that's still holding hands at the bus stop, you know, marveling at like what's around us, the trees, the sky, everything. But like the wonder is so important. For me, I feel a sense of wonder when I am listening to live performances. I love music. I love concerts. I love seeing an orchestra playing in perfect harmony. That brings me a, like goosebumps. Like that makes me wonder. That gives me a sense of awe. So whatever it is, whether that is like making art, science, like, you know, looking, reading a scientific journal might bring you wonder and awe, going to NASA, going to the science museum, or, you know, whether that's being in nature, there will be things in your life that bring you wonder that maybe you've sacrificed and you've lost that spiritual resilience, singing together with people, for example, whatever it is that you feel is a transcendental experience where you've transcended, like that is actually really powerful. I now want to come to the last element of uh, resilience, the, the final garden. Wow, that feels like it's just flown by. But the final garden is actually your social resilience garden. The previous four gardens were what we call four aspects of self. You have a mental aspect, you have emotional aspect, you have a body, physical aspect, and you have a spiritual aspect. Those are four aspects of self. In the Hoffman process, we call it the quadrinity. So we're always looking at like, you know, the four aspects of self, but there's one more final aspect of resilience, which is social. And research suggests that oftentimes this is the most important aspect. Whether you have a strong social support system, strong family, the five people who are most closest to you is that, is that you spend the most time with, whether they are healthy influences or not, whether you have a circle of trust, that goes so far to determining your likelihood of being successful and resilient in life. I really cannot overemphasize this one. Research suggests that families, for instance, that have like two or more family dinners a week together with their kids, their teenage kids are like only a tiny fraction as likely to indulge in destructive behaviors like self-harm, for example, or acting out than families who don't sit together and have dinner. So it's about having social networks because ultimately humans are mammals. We're mammals and we're hardwired to connect when babies are born and they are premature, if you provide them all the same, you know, care and attention, food, you know, warmth and everything, but you don't give them skin contact, they die. It's called failure to thrive. That human contact is so primal, even for introverts. I should say, especially for introverts, because whether you're extrovert or introvert, we all need the sense that we are supported, we have social resources. We are part of a tribe, a network. For hundreds and thousands of years, humans have relied on tribes to help us survive. It's been part of our survival that we need to be in a tribe. No human for 99% of human existence could survive if they were cast out by the tribe and left to die. It's literally death. It is honestly, the worst thing in the world in the past when you were cast out by a tribe, it meant that you were doomed to have no food, no resources, no survival, nothing, right? And that is the worst punishment. But yet we do it to ourselves today. A lot of times we feel shitty in our lives and then we cast ourselves out. We self-exile 
I don't want to go out with my friends. I'm just going to be a downer. I don't feel good enough to go out with my friends. Uh, I don't feel like they would accept me. I don't feel that they are right for me. And then we self-exile. And today is the kind of like iPod, iPad, you know, <laughs> you know, iPhone, right? everything is I. It's almost like we encapsulate ourselves in this bubble. And everything we want can be ordered in and delivered to us. I want something, oh, I'll just grab it. Uh, oh, I want a taxi, I'll just Uber it. Last time, you know, when I lived in the countryside, there was no such thing as delivery and there's no such thing as taxis. And that means we all needed to be a community. If I wanted to eat, I needed to either cook myself, maybe invite my friends over or, or somebody would invite me for a party or need to go off and I need to go to the supermarket, actually see real people and do real things, you know, uh, in the real world. Or so if I needed a lift somewhere, I would either, you know, have to like ask my friend for, for a lift to come over and send me and that meant making conversation or something like that. Or like I would have to learn how to do it. So like, you know, in today's world, we're kind of set up in a way where people can quite easily isolate themselves. That has never been the case in human history and is frankly very unhealthy. So social support is something that I strongly encourage. When we ran workshops at a university, one thing that we used to do an experiment was actually to get the students to take out their mobile phone and send two non-transactional text messages. Non-transactional means like, oh, it's not like, hey, by the way, can you do me this favor? Or like, oh, I'm asking you for something because so much of our WhatsApping is actually transactional. But I asked them, think of somebody that, you know, matters to you. Could be your army friend or somebody you lost touch with or some, some teacher of yours. It doesn't matter who. And just like send them a message and say, hey, I'm thinking of you. I'm so grateful for you. Some, like something like that in your own words. And then they would come back to me and they're like, oh, this is such a powerful experiment because like my friend reconnected with me and, you know, oh, I lost touch with my school friend and like we ended up, you know, catching up and I discovered that actually there's so much that we had in common that I forgot about this resource that I had in my life. So don't forget about your resources and do make a practice of continually building up that social capital. I don't just mean networking. I mean also resources like trusted confidants, like old school friends, people who really cared about you that maybe you've lost touch with. I think that's been quite a lot. I feel like I've given a mini uh, version of our resiliency workshop, but of course I could talk about this topic for one week, <laughs> you know, maybe one day we'll do a resilience retreat or something like that. But it's really important. Um, last thing I want to leave you with is switching gardens. So sometimes people feel very stuck because they are like trying to operate from like, oh, I'm trying to like figure it out. I feel really stuck. I can't figure it out. And sometimes I'll be like, well, instead of getting stuck in your mind, for instance, maybe switch to another garden. Maybe go to the physical garden, go for a job, eat a great meal. Maybe go to the social garden, call a friend make a date to go out, you know, but don't get, or maybe do a spiritual garden, like, you know, book some tickets to watch something that you're really excited to and then look forward to it. But don't get stuck. Don't get stuck in that kind of like trying to figure it out in one mind. And ideally, I want you to ask yourself, which garden is your default? Which one are you overusing and overdrawing from and which one are you which one or ones are you neglecting we need to plant seeds of healthy habits in all of these gardens we need to tend to them water them and if there are unhealthy practices that we're doing in any of these gardens whether it's like staying up late at night or whether it's like negative thoughts we need to weed those gardens of those unhealthy practices, right? So final thought, be a good gardener, harvest your five gardens of resources well, and then after that, nourish yourself with the fruits of your labor. I hope this episode has been helpful. Please do subscribe because, you know, we've noticed that a lot of people are listening to us, but maybe not as many are subscribing. And it really helps us continue to do this work that we do. If you support it by giving us a rating on Spotify or wherever you're listening to this and like and subscribe. And of course, share it with your friends. It really enables us to be able to take time out from our busy schedule to prioritize the podcast and making free content for all of you. Lots of love. And I hope to see you again in next episode of Comfort and Growth, the podcast for people who are passionate about productivity and personal growth. Bye!